Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the radio ministry of Twin City Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, or on the web at cicministry.org. This is Dick Cuffle, your host for the next half hour. We're speaking today with Bob DeWay, pastor of Twin City Fellowship and author of Critical Issues Commentary. Our topic today is Why Evangelicals Are Returning to Rome. This is part two. Robert, we had quite a fine session last week. Could you give just an overview of what we talked about? Because we're going to move on to some new material. I actually spent quite a bit of time in the last show defending the concept of Sola Scriptura in a lot stronger way than I actually did in this article, because I was assuming evangelicals believed in it. Then why did you have to go back and do it? Well, because I write two articles now saying why we need Sola Scriptura and start applying it. And the responses I've got are people fighting against the principle. Amazing. So it's no longer accepted in Protestantism that Scripture alone is a correct idea. So last program, I defended the idea and showed why it's correct. Excellent. Okay, well, today we're going to start out with part two. The uh, portion of the discussion that we had initiated had to do with the opening of the discussion of new reformations compromise sola scriptura Mm -hmm. and we talked about robert schuler and rick warren and a few of the other people that are doing that kind of work the second group that you talked about was c peter wagner so let's move on to that well he has what he calls the new apostolic reformation we won't spend a long time on this because we've already done a radio show just on this topic in fact two or three of them which you can listen to but it does fit in under the sola scriptura because i believe that his teaching that God is raising up new apostles and prophets in the church cannot be defended from Scripture. You talked about it last week a little bit about we have no new apostles. That was your basic point. Exactly. So if you want to debate with these apostles, and I have a friend who's done so, who actually had quite a discussion with a local apostle and presented these ideas to them, it's interesting. Some of them will back off and say, well, we can't speak exactly like Paul did. Okay, apostles has got a range of meaning. I guess that's true, but they do claim they're getting new revelations. But they don't claim that they're inerrant, and they don't claim that they're infallible. Oh, okay. So they got these revelations that maybe are from God and maybe aren't from God. But what I say is God doesn't bind us to error and confusion. He only binds us to truth. I agree. And so this is a worthless bunch of apostles. All they can do is speak confusion. And they don't try to prove their teachings from Scripture, because I've known a lot of these people in this movement and debated with some. They don't feel the need to do this. They would say, we can't go against Scripture, but we can go a lot of other places. (laughs) Okay. Well, I think this refers back to an article, which would be... Yeah, you could go hear the whole issues in our other programs on that. On New Apostolic Reformation. All right, well, that brings us to the Emergent Church. Now, who are the key players in that movement? The key people are Brian McLaren, Doug Padgett, Rob Bell. Those are the key guys. And then there's also people teaching what they call postmodern theology. And the key book was Grenz and Frankie's Postmodern Theology. And so there's a range of authors. They published a book called An Emergent Manifesto of Hope that actually has 23 essays written by different authors. But the same themes arise in all of these essays. Well, this happens to be an interesting area for you right now, doesn't it? Well, I'm writing a book on it. In fact, it's written. We're in the editing process as we speak. And I've uncovered, finally, through three years of research, the bottom line of where all this came from. Most movements don't just start in a vacuum. Yes. They have sources. Okay. And this movement is so amorphous, it's very difficult to find sources and understand where it came from. But I was able to do so through really copious research. And I have a book written that's going to reveal where all this came from. My little uh, subtitle yeah. would have been Medieval Monkism or Monasticism Gone Protestant <laughs> or yeah. Goes Protestant. Yeah. I thought that's what this is going to work into, I'm afraid. Okay, here's the deal with the emergent church. Sola Scriptura becomes a silly discussion. It's not even anything to think about because they don't believe you can know the meaning of the Bible. Okay, so any valid use of the principle, Sola Scriptura, 
is predicated on the idea of the clarity of Scripture, which Luther also argued for. Yes. Okay. Because the Catholic Church would say the Bible is very hard to understand, very difficult to interpret. The individual person is probably going to get it wrong. The only ones that can do this is the official teaching magisterium, yes. and they'll figure out what it means and tell you. And Luther battled against that and taught the clarity of Scripture. We can know what the Bible means. Yes. It's plain enough, and we can read it, and we can be bound by its ideas. It's interesting that that's, in one case, we'll do your thinking for you. The other case, you can do your thinking with the Scripture. Yes. Pretty close. And we're not claiming to be just individualists. We have churches, and as we gather together, we open the Scriptures together. But if somebody's going to claim to know the meaning, they got to give exegetical evidence we for it. We have teachers. That's yes, fact. Okay. that's true. But we still have a process to determine the meaning yes. because we read the text. We go back into the Greek and, and the Hebrew if necessary, and we find the context and we can know what it means. But the emergent church says you can't know. You can't know what any ancient written document means because meaning is a social phenomenon within a group. It's yes. not something that's transmitted outside yeah. of the group. And so the meaning is hidden, and it's a very sophisticated system of doubt that they've constructed, which I explain in my book on this topic when we get it published. But the bottom line is you cannot know. Their mantra is you cannot know, you cannot know, you cannot know, you cannot know. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so solo scriptura, as I say in my paper, dies a thousand deaths. You cannot know then what function does it have? That's exactly right. Well, what they do is they make the Bible like into a person, a she, that's what Doug Paget says. Yes. And the Bible, we interact with it, and what does it mean to you, and what does it mean to me? And you have this experience with the Bible, but you never arrive at the knowledge of the truth. So therefore, it cannot function to restrict our beliefs or restrict our practices. You made a statement that said the emergent reformation rests on the denial of the validity of foundationalism. Now, that's a pretty heady statement, but what does it mean? If it rests on it, we got to know what that means. Okay, foundationalism is a term from epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Okay. How do we know what we know? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just talk about the theological version of it. Okay. There's a theological version and a scientific one. All right. Okay. But the idea is that knowledge is built on a foundation of certain givens that are undeniable because it's just the way we are. Yes. Now, a Christian would say this is true because of the way God created us in his image is rational. All right. And some of the foundations in just epistemology in general would be things like the law of non-contradiction. All right. A is not non-A in the same way and in the same relationship. Yes. Okay. Well, why do we need that? Well, because otherwise you can't have any categories and you can't distinguish. That's you can't right. have the law of God. When God says the day that you die, the serpent says you shall not die, you have a contradiction. We have to be able to examine those as distinct entities that are not the same and are not compatible in order to make a truth claim and a decision. Yes. Do we believe God or do we believe the serpent? Yes. But the emergent church wants to have their synthesis. They don't want categories. So you have to attack foundationalism to get rid of things like non-contradiction, causality, basic building blocks of human knowledge, and then you can say about anything, you cannot know, you cannot know, you cannot know. And biblically, should I go into that? Well, just let me throw in one thing. But to complete your triad, there was also a thing about senses. Yeah, the basic reliability of sense knowledge. Okay, that, yes. was, that was the third one, and you talk about that exactly. in your book. Exactly. Yeah, I talk about it in my book, because if you can't know what you're looking at, no right. way you can't know. So you can't know, you can't know, you can't know. Okay. Now, let's apply this to biblical thinking. In the old days of evangelicalism, in my lifetime, there was a debate going on between evidentialists and presuppositionalists. Okay, what's the difference? Well, evidentialist says you start with evidence in history and then from that evidence find proof that the Bible was true and then the Bible becomes your foundation All right. for your theology. All right. Okay, and, and typically how that went is were there really apostles living in the days that Jesus walked the earth? Was Jesus really raised from the dead? Did he appear to eyewitnesses? Is Paul's writing on this credible? Not at